But we have a couple of scriptures that we're going to dive into today. If uh, you can follow along in your Bible, you can follow along on Version Live if you have that on your phone. Scott has some handouts um, that have the scripture verses we're going to look at. If you don't um, have one of those, just wave and Scott will get one of those to you. We are um, getting into our really kind of the meat of our series uh, that we're calling Major Lessons from Minor Prophets. And last week we kind of gave an overview of that. I think that there's a lot of times that people can write off, they can say, oh, minor prophets, that means that they don't have as much of a message um, to share with us as the major prophets do. And really, the only reason why they got that name is just because of the volume of their writing. They just simply don't write as much as the other prophets do. Um, I prefer to uh, call them, uh, the way that they were listed in the Hebrew Bible is the Twelve. I like that. So there's 12 minor prophets, so we'll just call them the 12. And I was, um, I was praying this last week about what order I wanted to share these, these uh, books with you in. Uh, because we, we looked at this chart last week, and this is kind of a zoom in of a, uh, of a, a much larger chart that shows you um, on the left side of the screen are the kings of Judah, and their dates and the prophets, and on the right side of the screen are the, the kings of Israel, the, the northern tribe. And as you can see, um, some of the uh, 12, they show up kind of early up here, like Amos is one of them, and then Hosea. And then some of them come like quite late down here. Um, but they're not necessarily listed that way in the Bible when they're, when they're in there. And so I was praying about, you know, should, should we go through it in kind of chronological order so we can get a sense of where they fit in? But I ultimately felt like it was best to just go through them in the order that the 12 show up in the Bible. Because I'm hoping that as we go through this, that um, you will then remember where they are. It's because the 12 are so small, it's easy when you're flipping in your Bible to just go right past them. And all of a sudden you're in the New Testament, you just, you missed them. But if we, I thought if we go in order of uh, the way that they're listed in the Bible, um, you'll maybe remember their order uh, there and, and have, be able to refer back to them. So we are going to look at Hosea. Um, that is the first book of the 12 that's listed there. Now I want to give you a different chart to kind of uh, zoom in a little bit so you can see this. This chart is divided up into um, these sections here. Up at the top um, tells you what prophets are were active in Babylon. So it means after the Israelites got carried off into captivity and then there were prophets that were still talking to them there. This middle section are people that are active in Judah. That's the southern uh, part of the, the nation after they split. And then down here are those that are active in Israel. And so I wanted you to see kind of this, this timeline here so that you can see a little bit of, of overlap so here's Amos right here, and you can see that Amos, is, his ministry is coming to an end right about the time that Hosea starts his ministry. So he was kind of taking up the baton from Amos, and you see that both of these guys are active in that southern or that northern area of Israel. Um, and what's interesting about Hosea is of the 12, he is the only prophet that is from and. Uh, one of the northern tribes of Israel, and then carries on most of his ministry in the northern area. And even when he leaves and he goes to Judah, uh, that he uh, continues to his prophecy, his writings are continued to direct it back to those northern tribes. So uh, right around 722 BC, right here, 720, that's when that northern tribe fell, falls, um, and you can see how Hosea's ministry continues past that point. He continues to prophesy uh, during that time. And he overlaps with Isaiah and Micah. Micah is another one of the, uh, the minor prophets, one of the 12 uh, that we're going to look at. So I wanted you to get kind of that, that glimpse of where his ministry fit in. So he and Amos are just kind of, uh, Amos is from Judah, but he goes to Israel and uh, is prophesying there. So... As I mentioned to you last week, every one of these 12 prophets introduces themselves to us, with the exception of Jonah. Every one of them introduces themselves and their background in the opening verse. And so Hosea tells us 
This is the word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Barry, during the reigns of, and what's interesting here, let me uh, go back to our chart, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit, is he says it, it, that he is during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Those are those kings right over here. Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, right over here. And so Amos, you can see he overlaps. And then he only lists the one king of the of Israel, Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, right up here, Jeroboam. And you'll see on the chart that it's Jeroboam the second. When the kingdom first split, the very first king of the northern tribes, his name was Jeroboam as well. So this is this is the second one. Now it's um, we know, like I said, this when he says uh, where he's from, the son of Barry, he's from the northern tribes. And in chapter seven of his book, he even talks about when he's talking about the king of Samaria, he calls him our king. So he he's recognizing that's that's where I'm from. So the reason why he lists these four kings from the southern area is that more than likely what happened was that he was prophesying verbally while he was here and before, sometime before 722 when the kingdom fell because of all of the pressures on him and on, uh, on just the, the nation of Israel, he probably left and went to the southern uh, area of Judah and that's where he would have written down his prophecies uh, at that time, okay. So he's even though that's why we keep him listed over here, even though he's he's mentioning these these kings that over here on the side. Um, Hosea's book is we're going to look at. It's really divided into two parts. We're going to look at part one today, which is just the first three chapters, and then part two are chapters four through fourteen. Um, and for being one of the minor prophets, he writes a lot more than some of the other prophets do. He still he had quite a bit to say. And uh, so we'll we'll, uh, we'll dig into that today. Um, here's here's what I want to to get you started thinking on with Hosea's life. This example that that he gives uh, in, the, in this message from God, but also the way that he lives it out in his life. So he's he's not only going to preach a sermon, he's going to illustrate the sermon. He's going to live it out with his own life as well. A lot of the prophets did that. Um, you'll even see them in. Um, the New Testament doing that same kind of thing. There is a prophet that comes to Saul, Saul, who has become Paul, and he takes Paul's belt off of him and ties his own hands with it and says, this is what's going to happen to the person that owns this belt. This is what's going to happen to them. They're going to be bound and carried off uh, into prison. And sure enough, that's what happened to Paul. So the, the prophets, a lot of their sermons were illustrated sermons, but <laughs> Nobody really goes to the extent of illustrating their sermon the way that Hosea does with his. Now, um, Hosea is going to, throughout his book, he is going to refer to Israel as an adulterous wife. That's the, the, the verbal picture that he's going to paint as, as he preaches and then as he writes it down. He's going to call uh, the northern tribe of Israel, an adulterous wife is the language that he uses. Now, he's not alone in doing that. Jeremiah, um, Isaiah, Ezekiel, three of the, ma the, the writers of the major prophets, um, they all refer to Israel that way as well. So just I want to give you a little background so you can see this. So let me show you. Here's how Isaiah says it. Upon a lofty and high mountain, you have openly and shamelessly set your idolatrous and adulterous bed. Even there, you went up to offer sacrifices in spiritual unfaithfulness to your divine husband. Now I want you to notice something, this idolatrous and adulterous. You will see those ideas and those words linked together frequently as we look at this. Look at what Prophet Jeremiah said. How you deck yourself and direct your ways to procure adulterous love. Because of it, even wicked women have learned indecent ways from you. I mean, what a, what a scathing rebuke. God says through Jeremiah to, to his people, to God's people, he says, you have become so bad that you're the ones teaching other people now how to behave indecently, how to be, behave so adulterously. Okay? And then... Ezekiel says this, you adulterous wife, you prefer strangers to your own husband. Wow. 
That is some rough words. But so Hosea, in his preaching, um, is, is really in, right in concert with them. And if you remember that chart, you saw Hosea actually starts his ministry before Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel start theirs. So it's very likely that Hosea's writings are influencing um, those guys as well. He's the, Hosea is the first one to start using this terminology. Um, and then the other prophets that we just saw, they pick up on it as well. But it is an apt picture of what's happening. So here's, what, here's how Hosea starts his book. Verse number two of chapter one. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, go take to yourself an adulterous wife and children of unfaithfulness because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery in departing from the Lord. Now, here's what's interesting about this, uh, the verb tense here. When, when God says to Hosea, go take an adulterous wife, it can mean one of two things. It can either mean she is already an unfaithful woman. She's already, in fact, some translations will even call her, they'll have adulterous wife, they will translate that promiscuous wife. So he, God is either saying to Hosea, go and marry this woman who has already been promiscuous. She's already sleeping around with other guys, but I want you to marry her. Okay, that's one way that this, the verb tense could be taken there. The other way is for God to say to Hosea, marry this woman, she is pure right now, she is a virgin, marry her, but she's going to become an adulterous, unfaithful, promiscuous wife in the future. Okay? In either case, if you were Hosea, in either case, your options aren't very good. <laughs> You know, you're, God's saying either go marry an unfaithful, sleeping around woman, or go marry a woman that is going to be unfaithful and sleep around on you. Now, let me show you why I think that the second of those is true. I think that, that uh, Gomer is, is his wife's name. I think that she was a pure virgin at the time that he married her. And here's why. Look at this. Um, so, verse number three, so he married Gomer, son of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Notice this phrase, she bore him a son. Hosea is clearly the father here. Now what you're gonna see as we go on a little bit farther, the next two children that are born, that phrase isn't there. It just simply says she conceived and had a son or had a daughter. It doesn't say she bore him a son. So it appears that their marriage started off at the beginning faithful um, and that she was, she was faithful to him, he was faithful to her. And so even the name of their first child, um, it, they are instructed to name him Jezreel. Jezreel is, um, the word means to harvest, but it is a neutral word. Jezreel can either mean you're doing a good job, you, you prepared the land the right way, you sowed the good seal, you, the seed, you took care of it, and you're going to reap a bountiful harvest that's going to satisfy you and fill your stomach and provide for your family. But a Jezreel harvest can also mean you've been sowing wickedness and you're about to reap judgment as a result of that. So the word itself, Jezreel, means it's neutral. It doesn't mean that it's something good or it's something bad. It just simply means... The prop, you can't stop the process. If you're sowing good seed, you're going to get a good harvest. If you're sowing bad seed, you're going to get a bad harvest. That's all it means. And so when, she, when it says that she bore him this son, and we're going to name him Jezreel, there's no indication one way or the other that she's been unfaithful to him. But then, as we go a little bit farther, it says, Gomer, verse number six, conceived again and gave birth. It doesn't say anything about Hosea being the father, so he probably wasn't. She probably had now become unfaithful to him. And you get a little bit of an indication of that when you see the name of their daughter, Loruma, which means not pitied or not loved. Now, remember I told you earlier that frequently those words for adultery and idolatry get lumped together. They get almost thought of as being the same thing. And that is because the 
all of the idolatrous practices in the nations surrounding Israel at this time, um, all every single one of them included sexual uh, worship, look at that in quotes, along with the idol worship. Every one of them had temple prostitutes, both male and female prostitutes. And so when you worshipped one of those false gods, when you brought your sacrifice to them, part of consummating your worship of that idol included sexual consummation with one of the approved temple priests or priestess. And there would be, you would sleep with them. There would be a sexual activity. And so in for the, the Hebrews, the word na'af, that means adultery, came to mean the same thing as an idolater. An idolater and an adulterer were in the minds of God-fearing uh, people the one and the same. That if you were an idolater, you were also an adulterer. Those two got linked together. And so here's God saying with this second child that is born to Gomer, but Hosea is probably not the father. It's probably, we don't know who the father is. Gomer probably doesn't know who the father is. It's probably not just been a one-time thing. It's probably become more of a lifestyle choice. Because this word that when God first says, go and marry an adulterous wife, a promiscuous wife, the word there covers any kind of sexual activity outside of the boundaries of marriage. Whether it's fornication before marriage, adultery after marriage, or even, and you'll see it lived out in the life of Gomer, even prostitution. So fornication, adultery, prostitution, prostitution, they're all summed up in that same word. And so God says, I've been trying to get your attention. And so he said, so now here's these people that they've been sowing. Remember Jezreel? They've been sowing, and it hasn't been good seed. And there's a harvest starting to come in. And the harvest is that you're not pitying them. God's not going, oh, poor you. Oh, I'm really sorry about that. He says, I'm trying to get your attention. In fact, in verse number seven, so well, let's read six first. Call her Lo Ruama, for I will no longer show love to the house of Israel that I should forgive them at all. It's not that God can't forgive, it's that they didn't want his forgiveness. They wanted to go do their own thing. We're having fun. During this time, remember I mentioned that Jeroboam II was the king here? Jeroboam II was as successful as any king ever since Solomon. He expanded the territory of Israel farther out uh, than anybody else except for Solomon. He brought more riches into the kingdom and established trade and things were going great. To put it in really like kind of our modern terms, unemployment was almost zero. The GDP was humming along. The economy was going great. The stock market was booming. Everything was great financially. People had a lot of disposable income they could do things with. And so here's Hosea going, yeah, but you're leaving God for this pursuit of money, for this pursuit of wealth. And the judgment is going to come. And they're like, Hosea, what are you talking about? I mean, we're masters of our domain. We got everything that we want. We can just kind of do life the way that we want to do it right now. And God says, this is what you're sowing. Just real. Here's what you're going to reap. And what you're reaping is, I'm not going to pity you when the judgment falls, when the harvest actually comes in. And so, by contrast, talking about the house of Judah, he says, here's what I want to do. I will show love to the house of Judah. I will save them, not by bow, sword, battle, horses, horsemen, but by the Lord their God. And when you read some of the accounts of what was happening during Judah at the same time, you see these armies coming against them, and God says things like, hey, you know what? Why don't you just send out the worship team? You don't have to send out the army. Send the singers out there, and I'll take care of the army. You're going to see how I'm going to give you the victory, not because you guys have a better army, but because you're worshiping me, because you're looking to me. And sure enough, the singers go out there, and the attacking army starts attacking each other. And so God says to Israel, lo ruama, hey, I want to do the same thing to you, but you keep sowing these evil seeds, 
and you keep pushing me away, you're stopping up your ears, you're not listening to what I'm saying, you're not returning to me, you're, in fact, you're running as fast as you can in the other direction, so when the judgment comes, I'm not going to have pity on you, and then to make the case even more, then one more child is born, and again, it's just that statement there, she, after she had weaned, lo ruama, Gomer had another son, not bore Hosea's son, yet another son that is born of an illicit relationship. And the Lord says, call him Loami, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Now you can imagine, I'm sure, maybe just a small little smidgen of what Hosea's heart must have been like. Can you imagine him pleading with her, maybe after the first child? You know, she comes and tells him when she's pregnant with Lo Ruma, hey, uh, Jose, I, I messed up. I am. Uh, I'm pregnant. It's, it's not your baby. Or maybe it was like after the baby was born. Maybe he didn't find out until then. And, and Jose looks and goes, I'm not the father of that child. He doesn't look anything like me. Gomer, what are you doing? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I messed up. I, it'll never happen again. I, 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 it was a one-time thing. I, it's, it's over. It's done with. I'm, I'm back. I'm yours. I'm faithful. Never going to happen again. And yet, here's another one. Now, this downward spiral. Hey, you're going to reap what you're sowing. I'm not going to pity you when the judgment comes. You're not even my people. It's because they just kept running from God as far and as fast as they could. In fact, if you look in Hosea chapter 2, you start to hear what God says. Rebuke your mother, rebuke her, for she is not my wife, and I'm not her husband. Let her remove the adulterous look from her face and the unfaithfulness from between her breasts. <laughs> Otherwise, I will strip her naked and make her as bare as on the day she was born. I will make her like a desert, turn her into a parched land, and slay her with thirst. I will not show my love to her children because they are the children of adultery. Their mother has been unfaithful. She has conceived them in disgrace. She said, I will go after my lovers who gives me my food and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. Therefore, this is God speaking, I will block her path with thorn bushes. I will wall her in so that she cannot find her way. I, she will chase after her lovers, but not catch them. She will look for them, but not find them. She will say, I will go back to my husband as at first, for then I was better off than now. She has not acknowledged that I was the one who gave her the grain, the new wine, and the oil, who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal, the worship of other idols. Therefore, I'll take away my grain when it ripens my new wine when it's ready. I'll take back my wool, my linen, intended to cover her nakedness. There's all of these things that, that she's going to forfeit. All of these things that God gave to her. Here's, we kind of explored Hosea's heart, but think about God back when he first brings the Israelites out of Egypt and he says to them, now if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure. From among all the peoples on earth, for all the earth belongs to me, and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. That's the relationship that God wanted to have, this, in, this intimacy, this exclusivity with these people. Hey, just you and me, I want to bless you, and I want to bless you so much that other people around the world will look at you and go, I want that kind of relationship too. And yet here they are just running away. And he says, all these things that he lists in chapter 2, all of these things that are being taken away from them. The Apostle Paul sums it up, really, with just these words. He says, for the wages of sin, the harvest, Jezreel, the harvest of sin, is death. It's death. And yet... In the middle of this, God says something totally unexpected, <clears throat> completely surprising. Never would have expected, I, I mean, if, if you were Hosea and your wife cheated on you once, and then again, and you're going, I don't know if I can give you a third chance, but this is, this is terrible. And so God says, hey, 
Jezreel, the harvest is coming. You're not going to be pitied when the judgment falls. You're not even my people. I'm not your God. And then look at chapter 1, verse 10. Yet. Yet. Even though this is going on, yet, the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. Now, keep this in mind, these next words, as he just said, these last two children, this daughter and this son, you are not loved and you are not my people, are their names. He says, in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel will be reunited and they will appoint one leader and will come up out of the land for great will be the day of Jezreel. Now it's a good harvest. And then chapter 2 opens with, Say of your brothers, my people, and of your sisters, my loved ones. So God says, here's what has been taken away from you. Here's what you're missing out on in a relationship with me. This is how despicable you've been, and this is the things that you're missing. And then again, in chapter 2, after all of these verses of what's going on, we come to verse number 14, therefore. And what I would expect to see there is, therefore, I'm about to bring down the hammer. Therefore, lightning bolts from heaven. Therefore, you are so dis disgusting in your sin. Therefore, I'm going to blast you. But what does he say instead? Therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. There I will give back her vineyards and I'll make the valley of Acre, that means the valley of trouble or despair, a door of hope. There she will sing as in the days of her youth, as in the day she came up out of Egypt. That's not what you expect. When, when the therefore comes after all of these disgusting, vile, adulterous things that, that she's done, the therefore, you don't expect God to say, and now I'm going to speak tenderly to you. I'm going to woo you back to myself. I'm going to court you again. I'm going to try to win your heart back to me again. Wouldn't you expect, like, I'm done with you. You made your own bed. You're, you're going to have to lay in this now. You're going to have to reap this harvest. Not, I'm going to allure you. I'm going to speak tenderly to you. I don't expect that kind of thing. Except... I hope for that kind of thing for myself. Because I've been as unfaithful as Gomer. And we said the wages of sin is death. Just before that, Paul said, all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. All of us deserve to reap the harvest of God saying, I don't pity you and you're not my people. And yet, don't you want him to say that to you? I'm now going to allure you. I'm going to woo you. I'm going to speak tenderly back to you. That's what Jesus did for us. God shows and clearly proves his own love for us by the fact that while we were still sinners, while we were still idolaters and adulterers, while we were still vile and disgusting and completely unfaithful to God, Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, died for us. That's what we want. And so God says, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to allure you. I'm going to woo you back. It's not coincidental at all that Hosea's name means salvation. God showed a picture to the life of Hosea. And so in chapter 3, the Lord says, now you've been living this out by marrying this adulterous woman. Now, the Lord said to me, go show your love to your wife again. Check this out. Though she is loved by another and is 
and adulterous. And not only that, but she had racked up some debts and probably was having to work those off as a prostitute. He said, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turned to other gods and loved the sacred raisin cakes. And so here's what I, Hosea says. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethic of barley. And I told her, you were to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or intimate with any man, and I will live with you. He had to actually pay the price to get her back. Not just win her heart, but he had to pay a price. Doesn't that sound like our Savior Jesus? That he had to pay a price on a cross where he shed his own blood. And you know what? This isn't because we were worthy of God's love when we were least worthy of his love, when we weren't worthy at all. This isn't about us. This is about how absolutely mind-blowing, inconceivably great God's love is. It's about his glory. Because in this chapter 2 of Hosea, listen to these words. I'm going to emphasize them. Therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. There I will give back her vineyards and make the valley of Acre a door of hope. There she will sing as in the days of her youth, as in the day she came up out of Egypt. And that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband and no longer my master. I will remove the names of the Baals from her lips. No longer will the, their names be invoked. In that day, I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the creatures that move along the ground. Bow and sword and battle I will abolish in the land so that all may lay down and safely. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness and you will acknowledge the Lord. In that day, I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the skies, and they will respond to the earth, and the earth will respond to the grain. Here we go, a better harvest now. And the new wine and oil, and they will respond to Jezreel. I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one called, not my love. And I will say to those called, not my people, you are my people. They will say, you are my God. We don't do it. We can't do it. There's no way for us to get back. God says, I will do it. We are held like Gomer. Gomer had gone so far down the path and become indebted, to become enslaved, become a prostitute that she couldn't get out. She owed a debt that she could never pay off. As did we. The wages of our sin was death. We could never pay that off. And then Jesus, when we were least worthy, he came and said, just like Gomer had to be had the price paid, Jesus came, our salvation, and said, Let me pay the price. I will do this, and I'll call you my people. I think it's wise for us always to pray this prayer of David and say, search me, God. Is there, are there any idolatrous thoughts or ways in my life? Any adulterous ways? I, maybe I haven't, I haven't even seen it. I, but, so search me. Is there a thought pattern I have? Is there a lifestyle decision I've made? Is there, is there something that I'm doing that offends you? That offends your holiness? Show that to me so that I can ask for forgiveness and I can repent from this. We've said this before, and, and it's true. The mark of a maturing Christian is not one that never sins, but it's one who is closing the gap always between recognition of sin and repentance. We pray that prayer, God, show me if there's any offensive way. He shows us, and we say, I'm sorry, forgive me, and I repent of that. I'm not going to do that anymore. We close that gap. We don't struggle with it. Well, let me justify that why what I was doing was okay and it's really not that bad. And you know, don't, don't delay. Don't make that gap go out as quickly as you can. When the Holy Spirit points to something, when he taps you on your heart and says, 
hey, deal with this quickly. D don't, don't make the excuses. Don't try to justify to say, you're right, I'm wrong, please forgive me. I'm not going to do that anymore. I repent of that. Close that gap. And then lean into this alluring, wooing, restoring love that God gives. I love these, ver these words that God says about himself. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice and love and compassion and faithfulness. Only God has those perfectly. And that's what he wants to give to us. Anytime that we need them. Anytime that we started to go astray. Even the little bit. I, you know what? I've never met somebody yet. I just was talking with a, a friend the other day that's in a, a Christian-based, a Bible-based substance abuse program dealing with an addiction to alcohol. He never said, you know what? When I grow up, I'm going to become an alcoholic. I've never met anybody that said that. Drug addict, alcoholic, somebody involved in prostitution or what. I've never met anybody that said to me, yep, this was my goal for my life. This is what I planned. When I was a little boy, this is what I dreamed of doing. This is how I foresaw my life going. Never met anybody. Those small choices along the way. Just like Gomer made those small choices away from Hosea and eventually found herself trapped and couldn't get out. Imagine what she thought of herself. I'm worthless. Why would anybody ever want me? And then Hosea, salvation, shows up and says, I'm here to pay the price and I'll love you forever. That's what God does for us. His love brings us back no matter how far we've gone and his love woos us even if we've just made a small deviation. He constantly calls us back in his love and his faithfulness and his righteousness. What a miracle it is of his love. Let's pray. I want to pray for you today if, if you are here or you're watching this online and you've never had that personal relationship with God through what Jesus has done for you. The Apostle Paul uses this exact same analogy, the same story. In fact, I, I'm sure that, that he had Hosea in mind when, when he wrote about all of the things that God wanted us to be, but how we had run away from him. And then in Ephesians chapter 5, he tells us about how Jesus, as our husband, gave up everything to win us back, to make us perfectly clean and blameless and holy in his sight, just like Hosea did for his wife, Gomer. My friend, if you've never asked God to forgive you of your sins, you've never allowed Jesus to, to clean you up and to provide that forgiveness, he wants to do that today. I promise you, I promise you, you have never, ever gone too far from God's love. I promise you, according to God's word, you have never lived one unloved day in your life. God desperately loves you. And even now, he's speaking tenderly to you. He's alluring you. He's wooing you. He wants you to be in a relationship with him. And so if you've never asked for that, that forgiveness, you can do that today. So I'm going to just pray a prayer. You don't have to repeat my words, but you just pray a prayer, something like this, to invite God into your life and invite him to forgive you of your sins. God, I acknowledge I'm so far away from you. I've heard you calling me before and I just wanted to do my own thing. And now I'm desperate for you. And I know I can't do anything to pay off the debt that I've racked up. I can't get out of the situation that I'm in on my own. I'm in too deep. I've offended you too many times, God. I've pushed your hand away. 
But today I believe that you're wooing me, you're alluring me, you're calling me back to you. And I thank you that when I was the least worthy of your love, that's when Jesus came. He died on a cross, shed his own blood on my behalf so that I can be made clean and holy and righteous in your sight. So today, God, that's what I ask for, is that you would forgive me of those sins, buy me back, put me in a right relationship with you as Jesus comes into my life now as my Savior, my Lord, my very best friend, and you, God, as you become like faithful, loving husband to me to care for me all the rest of my days. And Father, every single one of us that even know you as Savior, there are times that we say things and think things, do things that grieve your spirit because they're just a slight deviation. It's taking us a little bit off the path diverting our attention somewhere other than you. So God, we pray this morning along with David in that 139th Psalm, search me, O God. Look at my heart. See if there is anything, anything at all, no matter how small it is, anything in me that would offend you or detract from your glory. Holy Spirit, as you show that to me, I will be quick to ask forgiveness for that, and I will repent from that. I won't do it anymore so that I can be restored. It's your love. It's your faithfulness. It's your righteousness that wins me back, that clears the record, that brings me even closer to you. So Lord, may we always be quick to pray that prayer and quick to respond to the way that your Holy Spirit points things out to us. May there be such a peace and a love about our lives because we know the relationship that we have with you that may it be evident to every person that sees us. Our family members, our co-workers, our neighbors, wherever we are, may we just absolutely glow in the love. May we be almost as the phrase goes, like a blushing bride, as we think about your great love for us. And may that be so attractive that other people say, what is it that you have? What's going on in your life? I want that in my life too. God, use our lives as a testimony. Use the relationship that we have with you as a way to win others to you as well. Thank you, Lord, for your great love, for your redeeming love, Thank you for the salvation that you extend to us day after day, moment after moment, whenever we need it. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you, friends. Thanks for being here uh, today. Um, read through this passage again. I love reading this story of Hosea and Gomer and see what God does there. It's a short uh, three chapters. Read that again. Just let that soak in your spirit. And then let's close that gap between the time that the Holy Spirit points out something to us and the time we repent of it. Let's close that gap real quick so that we can stay right there as close to God as we possibly can be. I love you, friends. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you soon.